All right, so I'm here with Dr. Hoffman for the ABCT CBT Pioneers Project. Um, so to just kind of spur start it off, can you tell us a little bit about how you got interested in clinical psychology? Well, I have always been interested in science and uh, in the human mind and, um, and exploring uh, emotions. This has always been an interest of mine. And um, I've been walk I was working with um, an anxiety researcher, Anke Ehlers, who is now a professor uh, at Oxford. And uh, she got me interested in uh, anxiety disorders. And then I uh, moved on from there. So I then uh, started a postdoc uh, with David Barlow in the early 90s. And then uh, since then have been studying anxiety disorder, psychotherapy, emotion research. And uh, this interest of mine never left me. Um, uh, I did not have a particular personal relationship to it. Uh, in a way, I, uh, I, can, I guess I can relate to social anxiety if, if there's any anxiety problem that, uh, that I could identify with. So I've been doing that for most of my life as well. Um, uh, but uh, many of the other anxiety states, uh, I kind of see from an observer's perspective uh, rather than from a, how it feels like to be uh, in that uh, uh, situation. Oh, uh, to experience that that state, um, but um, but I find it fascinating, um, and uh, and it's the never-ending questions that one can ask about these issues. Yeah, yeah. So along that vein, what would you say are some of your most important contributions to research and practice in clinical psychology? That's hard to brag sometimes. <laughs> well, I would I would think that the field needs to decide that. It's it's a kind of an odd thing for me to to point that out. But I think what I'm working on uh, most recently, I'm, I'm I guess it's probably everybody would say that whatever you're working on right now is probably you know, that excites you the most. Uh, and right now I'm working on. Um, on a new way of, uh, uh, of uh, approaching uh, mental health and uh, mental health problems. Uh, uh, we develop uh, with, together with my friend and colleague uh, and former uh, uh, adversary, uh, Steve Hayes, <laughs> uh, I've been developing uh, something called process-based therapy, which is uh, the idea is to, to step away from a simplistic um, nosological idea where there's a sort of the idea of there's a latent disease that we carry with us. May, uh, may you call it depression or panic disorder, etc. cetera. Uh, and, uh, and where we group people uh, uh, together uh, that who, who don't really belong together uh, and in clinical practice, that's what you are doing. I think you're kind of trying to get to the individual uh, where uh, and the treatment itself is not uh, guided by the diagnostic uh, label that you're imposing on people, but rather understanding on um, what a pro how a prob how problems are being maintained uh, and then how to uh, how to move people from a uh, from that state into a better state. And so we combine in this particular th therapeutic approach, this is heavily based, obviously it is it is rooted in CBT. There's no doubt about it. CBT, I'm still a CBT therapist, obviously, but uh, it is rooted in evolutionary science, uh, combining that with a complex network approach where we uh, conceptualize uh, the psychological problems as a set of, of um, as, a, as a complex network that is that we need to understand. Uh, and in order to identify what processes need to be targeted in treatment uh, for uh, the individual to move out of this state. Um, so it's, it combines complex network uh, approaches with evolutionary science in, in the framework of CBT. Wow. So what kind of got your interest in sort of the therapy side of things started? Um, so moving away from just studying anxiety, um, but more so treating it and targeting it. I would uh, I, I would be surprised if anybody who started psychology uh, was not interested in, in in therapeutic approaches, especially clinical. I think this is um, uh, uh, and um, I have to say the CBT idea that I encountered early on in my uh, education as a student just got to me. I just I felt like this this is it. That that uh, obviously is not the whole story, but but it made perfect sense. I kind of as most of us 
got interested initially in, in Freud and read Freud and 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 that all felt like it that can't be you know that doesn't match reality and it's these are nice ideas and uh, and then when I uh, became familiar and studied uh, uh, Tim Beck's work and uh, and CBT Aaron T Beck's work um, that really got me hooked and uh, I was also fortunate to uh, to to got to know him very closely so I became a, I became a, a back scholar and uh, and a um, and a back uh, uh, supervisor and uh, we have uh, frequent exchanges and so uh, he uh, is one of those brilliant minds that that open up a lot of doors and guide you in the right track I believe so uh, clearly without him as a person the field would be very different uh, and uh, certainly I would have not I would not have chosen this career path and I would not be where I am without him. Yeah. And you mentioned a little bit about like Freud and sort of starting your studies there. Um, in your opinion, how do you think we can do a better job of disseminating CBT to clinicians now? I think CBT has has uh, has gone into too much of a, of a technical uh, a treatment. And that's often what we are being sort of perceived as as technicians and that's not what we want to be and that's also not who we are um, I think we need to bring back sort of the excitement that also attracts many people to other therapeutic approaches and I think the third wave is one reason why it became such a hype uh, and mindfulness another hype uh, and I've been studying all those, all of those things I think there's clearly something to it but clearly there's this excitement is lacking in the in the traditional CBT uh, approach I think people became uh, too tied to to these protocols to treatment protocols and this was probably the worst thing that happened to CBT we kind of um, we we fell in this DSM trap uh, where we uh, were in the past, you know, that was that why the DSM sort of and also ICD is the same issue, obviously. Um, the reason behind a, a nosological system was uh, has always been and and it was a to develop treatments targeting a specific um, a categories that never came to fruition that never turned out to be true these kind of categories do not tell us really much if anything at all about treatment approaches uh, the pharmaco this uh, uh, therapy orientation fairly you know quickly realized that there's now one drug that you give for virtually any problem the SSRIs you take you take for virtually anything and um, and this big, big started from uh, developing very specific components targeting categories to now one drug working for everything which is and, and the pharmaco um, therapy uh, researchers they are at a at a at a at a state where they feel like it is not going further and so now they're exploring other completely novel ideas like psychedelics and and, uh, and other things to to kind of move that that area forward the cbt um, approach went the opposite way initially we had a one treatment that worked for everything there was the in, obviously psychoanalysis was they are but also cbt was pretty much a standard approach that we used for virtually any kind of problem and they became more and more specific targeting these categories these dsm categories so dsm imposed these restrictions these limits these boundaries that made no sense and we became it's not to say that we didn't achieve something we did we developed various specific techniques for uh, problems for certain issues that are linked to diagnostic categories, but we're not uh, we, we, we're not really treating the categories. We're treating parts that are aspects of these categories that are often so-called transdiagnostic. We, we are pretty good at, uh, you know, targeting metacognitions or or rumination or uh, or negative affect or uh, or etc. But these are things that are that you see in all in in many different categories. They're not so we need to step away from that idea altogether of treating DSM categories and finding these processes that are 
um, not only explaining why a problem is maintained, but then also how to disturb these, uh, uh, this, this maladaptive network, if I call it already, if I could use my, my terminology in PBT. So we want to kind of, uh, uh, and also step, uh, this also brings it in a, to, a much, uh, to a bit of a broader context that we're not just reducing symptoms. We're not just there to, to make people feel a little better and, and then sending them out into the world. And now they, they uh, whatever, they have there are certain symptoms, fewer, fewer of those symptoms than, than before, but they're not, they're not at a point where they want it to be. We, we rarely look at remission. We rarely look at, um, at, at achieving something that people want to achieve. But so it's not just reducing problems, but we want to bring them to a different point in their life, uh, in their life. So it's, it can also be, you know, um, you might have to sometimes endure hardship in order to uh, attain where you want to go, uh, uh, finding meaning in life and so forth. So these are pretty deep issues that, however, we should bring back into our therapy and not, not becoming technicians to reduce symptoms, but rather becoming therapists who actually uh, uh, bring people out of their state and into a completely different state that they that they would like to 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 go to, and that's also part of the problem figuring out where they want to go to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you brought up the word like incite, like excitement, like bringing the excitement back to it. Is that sort of your idea for how to do that, taking this more non-reductionist standpoint, or do you have other ideas? Well, I would. Um... Uh, I would not call it non-reductionist. In fact, I would. I, I think that it needs to be a, a a radical new approach to mental health. Radical. So not just stepping away from the DSM. That's actually not radical enough. I know it sounds radical, but it's not. But rather, we also we even need to get away from the idea that um, that people are so similar because they're not. We are actually interested in these dissimilarities between people. We need to step away from a nomothetic approach toward a radical ideographic approach. Now, this has, this has pretty broad implications because we're trained as psychologists. You're trained in, as a student to, to use means and standard deviation and, and, and do these, these, these um, you know, multivariate statistics and so forth, but you all, we, we're always grouping people, assuming that they have some sort of latent thing in common, right? But in therapy, when we do clinical work, we actually throw that, we put that out the door because we, we are not really interested in what is the similarity between people, what we're interested in, what's the difference between people. And so we need to go ideographic. Um, see that the problem is that we have been misguided in a way by a very uh, simplistic idea of of uh, of human suffering and and also of psychology in total. We we are the bell sh the bell curve is with us all the time, and you know maybe the bell curve is not meaningful in order to actually uh, do what we need to do. We need to actually look at these differences between people much more carefully. So this, what, this is what, uh, uh, what the PBT also does. We want to go ideographic, uh, dig really deep into the uh, complexity of human nature of the individual. We want to study the person. It's similar, if I could uh, compare it maybe to another um, medical field, let's say, um, let's say cancer, okay? Um, so there is still the word cancer, but the more you understand cancer, the less meaningful it gets. You actually then understand what kind of cancer it is, what, uh, what is, uh, 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 you sometimes even have gen genetic markers of certain cancers. You have specific uh, treatments that very, very uh, uniquely targets that. That is now a bit of an uh, odd comparison because I'm, 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 I was kind of, you know, trying to get away from this latent disease. But this is sort of what what's the, the idea is that we, the more we understand uh, a complex phenomenon the less meaningful it gets to group that together. And we are way beyond that point where we should step away from grouping everybody in the same group just because they have they share surface symptoms in common. Or, or uh, you know, depression, you can identify um, 
literally hundreds of different subgroups of depression, depending on how you combine your four out of 12 symptoms. Uh, same with panic disorder. Uh, that's even, even if you only look at people who share the same symptoms, well, they just happen to share the same symptoms, but it's not, this is not to say that they have the same problem and the di same diagnosis, and they sh certainly doesn't, it doesn't tell you how to treat them. Um, that is a, uh, 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 for that you need to understand how things, how problems are connected, how they are related to one another. This is the essence. We need to understand the connectedness of this issue. This is, by the way, not at all new uh, to, and it sounds radical, but but uh, our other dis, uh, neighboring disciplines very much have, have uh, embraced it. When you uh, make predictions of future events, may it be climate change or uh, the, econom uh, the economy or, uh, or uh, even genes, how genes interact, all of that is uh, is is done in the con in the construct in the concept within the framework of um, the complex networks and the, the human being the person forms a complex network. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so so kind of understanding all of your views about where we need to go, what we need to do as a field at CBT, what changes would you want to see sort of in graduate teaching? So going all the way back to the students um, and sort of getting that in there early. I think one is we need to get away from a um, from a school thinking sort of orientation. What is your orientation? What is my orientation? Sort of the psychoanalysis or or uh, CBT or more B versus more C or the or ACT. Uh, we need to step away from it because it really doesn't matter. We all should know how to adequately uh, target problems. Uh, so these competencies are very essential. We need to understand. Uh, what the what kind of strategies you need to uh, you need to adequately uh, uh, show and do with your client for uh, the problem to be targeted. Um, then, uh, in order to it, so it, it is fine to have to have likings of you know you like one approach better than others, but it's not okay to have a tunnel vision and to ignore. Um, aspects that should be targeted. Uh, it is just not uh, um, uh, not just not meaningful, but it's also not fair toward your client. So we need to have a broad enough vision uh, that we also entertain other 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 viewpoints that are not within your own sort of upbringing and orientation. Um, it's not to say that we all should now become um, expert uh, therapists in psychoanalysis and CBASP and, and, and ACT and so forth. That's, this is precisely not what I want, uh, but rather figuring out what are the core competencies that every clinician should know and then, and then uh, applying those core competencies to a given individual. Uh, and, and then these walls break down. We don't really need to identify ourselves as a particular therapist or coming from, a, uh, from any particular um, orientation because it's meaningless. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that sounds like a really great idea and a great sort of avenue for the future. Um, given sort of our time, kind of switching gears a little bit, but if you could talk a little bit about like how membership in ABCT has impacted your career as that's kind of the organization putting this series on. ABCT has always been my my family. My very first conference uh, uh, was an ABCT conference, and that really also got me got me excited about the field, uh, about the, the community, and uh, um, I occupied a lot of hats as part of ABCT. I started out as an anxiety sick president, then became um, an editor of cognitive and behavioral practice. Then I was a, a rapid large and I was a president and uh, I, I keep uh, close contact with, um, with uh, all my friends. In, in a way, ABCT, if you, if you are a young person, you will see if you stick to it, uh, it is incredibly rewarding. Uh, it is not only that you grow up uh, and grow old with people, that is obviously a part of it because, you, but it's also this community uh, that we, that ABCT is representing that is, uh, that is uh, 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 very inclusive. Uh, we've gone through a lot of um, also 
debates about even about certain orientations about approaches you know i remember pretty well when we uh, when the when the french and shampiro eye movement desensitization reprocessing issue came came on the on the scene and abct was there to to uh, debated that they didn't they didn't turn into an EMDR organization, but they the, the doors were open for controversial ideas to be shared, to be discussed, to be debated. And obviously, it's nonsense, but still, it was it was there to to discuss. Um, there was um, similar with uh, the whole the whole um, third wave movement uh, and and. Uh, uh, act uh, that actually if anything was sort of very critical initially towards CBT and and that became a discussion point and and we act, I think we all grew out of it we this sort of these controversies and these scientific debates they are this is what science is all about you don't want to close your ear and 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 just do what what you've been doing all along but rather it allows you to reflect and to reconsider and and uh, uh, have a different uh, slightly different perspective on your on your own uh, status and um, so abct is is my by far my favorite conference it, it i will uh, I will be very sad because I will probably miss it this year because I'm in Germany and and because of the uh, the pandemic. Uh, it is my I think my only time that I will. Uh, I think I might have been. I think it was one more. Uh, I believe when I got married uh, and then my wife reminded me. You know, it's, it's a problem with the time frame and so we kind of adjusted uh, when we celebrated. But so anyway, the the issue is. Um, uh, uh, ABCT is is a wonderful organization, and and I really hope that it will uh, they will continue and 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 attract a lot of young people and and get them excited in in that field. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for your time and your thoughts. Thank you. Okay.